sustain life and sustainability. Through a resource-based economy, abundance from technology, shared by all humanity. Imagine freeing all the people to discover, invent, and create. Imagine instead of countries An open source society Nonviolent communication Liberty and collaboration Imagine all the people Living life in peace to you. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you join us and the world. One. Imagine possibilities Meeting everybody's needs No more crime or poverty I hope your research and degree that you need all the people to live life families. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you join. And the world will live as one. Next up will be our formal traditional introduction with Warren. Do you are you gonna sleep this back? I think you Tiffany for that wonderful song. That was beautiful. One more time, one more time. <laughs> okay, well, I just first want to say thanks to everyone that's here, to not only the members, but also most importantly, you know, everyone that's coming in from seeing the flyers, talking to one of the members, or just hearing about it from the whole festival. So um, I really appreciate everyone coming out. My name is Warren. I'm a member of the Zeitgeist Movement. We're a global sustainability advocacy movement. Now, before I proceed any further, let me just get a show of hands of how many people actually know about the Zeitgeist Movement. Okay, okay. Okay, so about half and some, uh, so, I, oh, hey, glad you made it. Yeah, and um, so a brief rundown of what the Zeitgeist Movement is, is that, you know, a couple years ago, one of the movies first came out about some of the, you know, social systems uh, really digging deep into the problems and the root causes and the issues. And the movement sparked worldwide. And chapters started springing up all around the world trying to advocate a resource-based economy. This is uh, most of the ideas coming from Jack Fresco and Buckminster Fuller. And so what we do as a chapter is that we try to spread education and awareness to the public about what our current paradigm is and what we can essentially transition into. And so, okay. What were the movies you talked about that came out a few years ago? Okay, well, the first movie that came out, this officially for the chapter, was officially for the movement was actually Zeitgeist Movement 4. 
Addendum and Zeitgeist the Movie was the first two movies before that. And the movement actually sparked after the second one, Addendum. And the addendum went in, uh, just dug into our federal reserve system and the corrupt banking system. I see. And so, okay, thanks. So today we have presentations coming from members. Uh, the lineup right now is after the introduction, we're going to be talking about capitalism as a social structure, what our reality really is right now, what kind of world we're living in, and what we could potentially move into, which is a resource based economy. Um, Tiffany would then be. Rochelle actually would then be going up and talking about uh, objectives of lean manufacturing, you know, using technology and the planning process to reduce waste, waste. consumption. Yes. And so, and then Tiffany will be going up to talk about the transition. How can we start moving into a more self-sustaining community, a more localized, tight-knit family? So. We're all part of this same planet together. And then we will have a guest speaker, uh, Anthony from Caramon, and come up and talk about some initiatives about actually localizing food production now. Okay, so you're probably wondering like, why, why are we here? What are we doing? Why, why do we even need a change in the first place? That's actually one of the main questions a lot of people ask is that, what's wrong with the world we're living in now? Well, Last year when Fukushima happened in March, there, uh, Japan was hit by a 9.0 earthquake. And looking at the events that followed and what happened, really startled me. Um, essentially what happened was, when they got hit by the earthquakes, the reactors lost their emergency cooling systems. And so what essentially they've been doing is pumping hundreds of thousands of tons of radio uh, of ocean clean ocean water to cool down these reactors and then it just comes right back out and so now we have this large amount of radioactive water coming in from japan about to reach the west coast in less than a year what does what does all this mean well what I'm here to talk about is the dire circumstances our environment and social and society is facing right now. Indeed, this is probably the most important dialogue our generation will ever have, which is essentially, how can we survive as a species together and actually reach a sustainable paradigm to allow all life on Earth to flourish and prosper for the longest amount of time? Our system is, we're living in an infinite growth paradigm, but if you think about it, the planet is finite. We have limited resources on the planet. So infinity, infinity, mathematically, is not quick. In terms of radioactivity coming in from Japan, studies show that, you know, you would think that uh, a really, let's say they dropped a nuclear bomb. We would think that that would actually be worse than, let's say, a leak from one of the plants. But studies actually show that low doses that are accumulated over time is actually worse than a single high dose. What is, so what does all that mean? The IAEA came out in November of 2011 saying that five, we, we only have five years left before it hit the point of irreversible changes in our climate. Three years ago when I was taking a geology class was actually the first time I actually learned about global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it. And seeing Al Gore's movie and then talking to my professor, a lot, you know, when I first watched the Al Gore movie, I wasn't really, I wasn't really sure. There was a lot of controversy over it. But then hearing from my professors talking about we only have 10 years left. Well, so we we're actually short on time. We have eight years left. That was then, and now only my five. And so irreversible changes in our environment, in our climate means that it will have a snowball effect. We won't see the extreme implications right now, but it's gonna continue far on into the future. We don't know what's gonna, what it's gonna be like in 100 years. Sea levels rising. And if we look at the trends in the past decade or the recent years, 
we can see that natural disasters have been actually increasing in a more potency, more force. And the 400 nuclear reactor plants on this planet are not built to withstand the increasing natural disasters. We had three events in the US alone in just the past year. Fort Calhoun, Cooper, and Nebraska was flooded to where they only had about a four feet buffer room before the plants were actually not able to withstand the flood. And in New Mexico, the Los Alamos, the, the one of the largest nuclear weapons developers, they had the biggest wildfire New Mexico has ever faced, or at least in recorded history. And only 1% of the plant was contained. I mean, only 1% of the fire was contained by firefighters over a week's time or whatnot, and they had 30, 20 to 30,000 drums of plutonium barrels sitting outside, surrounded by the fire, and they, all they did was cover it with fabric tents. Now, if any of you guys, I, didn't, I never knew anything about radiation before. Radiation basically emits energy. I'm not a nuclear physicist, so please don't hold me again to it, but it increases illnesses, ailments. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? DNA changes. And so, and it accumulates in our body, and just like the environment, it's gonna have a snowball effect. So my point is, is that the paradigm we're living in, just because we don't see the problems happening in our backyards, because the communities we live in, we're not able to see the implications of our actions as a whole, not just individually. I'm not putting blame or responsibility, I'm just saying we as a whole. So we're living in a very important time right now. The question is, can, do we have to continue doing what we're doing? Or can we change and be smart enough to do something about it before it gets out of hand? So, I know, I know it sounds all bad, but I actually have some good news. <laughs> I know. I'm, I don't know how I have good news, but actually, this all seems bad. This all seems really just... But actually, a lot of good things have been going on because of this. For instance, Japan has actually been shutting down all their reactors because of people are protesting. So now they're living in a more low energy lifestyle right now. A lot of other countries like Germany, Germany and I believe France, you know, um, we're slowly starting to see this consciousness arising around the planet. Where we're like, hey, maybe we don't need this. So with the, with the bad, there's always the good too. So this is what we are here to do together as a single family, to come together, to work on the problems. I'm not talking about, I don't care what organization or name it is. We're all fighting essentially the same battle, which is the fight for human needs, the fight for life. And so, with, with all that said, we are the Zeitgeist Movement, and we're here to present a viable solution, not the solution, but just a better plan than perhaps we have right now. And we hope to come together with initiatives like the Care Mob and other sustainable, we come together and we make changes together. So, so does anyone have any questions to start off? drives it home when we understand that the potency of the particular particle is half-life. How long does it take to actually drop down half its potency? Thousands of years. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yes, I'm, I'm and we knew that. The experts knew that. Yes. And still they made this strange decision to go ahead and do nuclear power plants and not to know what to do with the waste. 
your name? James. James. Yeah. Thank you, James. I'm really glad you brought that point up because I feel like it's a very essential point to our dialogue. Leaders. I mean, this is ridic ridiculous. And when I tell, you know, most of the conversations I have with people is that, like, this, even if we're, even if something happens to us, you know, like, they're like, oh, it's, it's gonna be okay because whatever happens, nature happens and it'll be all right because nature will just follow its course. But if we're gone, that means no one's here to take care of those reactors. And with all the radioactive materials here lasting for thousands of years, it's gonna be here for a long time. And we don't know the implication for this. We don't know the implications. So thank you very much, James. That's a really good question. Uh, anyone else? That's another good point, which is that, like, what another implication of this single disaster is that now we've got to consider is surfing safe? Is playing out the ocean and the beaches safe? Is the water I'm drinking safe? Is the air I'm breathing safe? So, this is uh, Michio Kaku, which is one of the top theoretical nuclear physicists right now. Um, he's been saying since last year that it's covered the entire northern hemisphere. But where's the dialogue that's happening? That's my that's my question. So thank you. And anyone else have any questions before we we're, we're okay? Okay, well thank you very much and I appreciate your time. And now we have a card. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Everybody just sits so far back. Is that, is that, a, is that a cultural thing? Can we just kind of like se separate out like that? Can you can you come forward a little bit? Yeah, I'm coming forward right here. I'm saying the people in the back, can you kind of come down a little bit or no? Nah? All right. Just giving the invitation. All right. I, I think it's a cultural thing, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> I welcome you guys to come here this morning. This is our first presentation um, out here at Whole Earth. What's it called? Whole Earth Festival. I don't even know what it's called, that's my first time. So this is our first time coming out here and our goal is to try to get a uh, student group out here for the uh, Zeitgeist Movement. Uh, it's one thing to have a, an objective, a resource-based economy, which is huge, right? Uh, in order to do that, you have to have people to do it. You know, you, you can watch films all day, you can have lectures, but people have to get in dialogue like we're doing face-to-face -face and, and talk about it. So um, I'm gonna have, while I'm running my mouth, I'm going to have uh, some of my members here pass out an evaluation sheet. Please give us some feedback because this is our first time. And there's also a half sheet here about the movies that we're going to refer to um, in this event. And um, I think we may, if we don't if we run out of those, we can find some more of those. Yeah. Um, okay. So as Warren was saying, this movement was kicked off by, by essentially a couple of videos that Peter Joseph did not realize were going to go viral. I mean, it was huge. And um, I had just been reading a book called The Web of Debt. And I had read it before I even saw the videos. It was talking about the history of the banking system and the Federal Reserve and fiat money supply. Who's familiar? Is anybody, everybody familiar with the fiat money supply? I am. All right. Keep your hands up. All right. So we're not strangers to this. We don't have to have a lot, a lot of conversation about it. But it blew my mind to read about the history of the banking system because I never learned about it in... Uh, in high school, you know? And so, reading about that, and then I happened to find the, the videos, the Zeitgeist Addendum and Zeitgeist Moving Forward, I'm like, wow, this is a great concept. 
we're at a, we're at a juncture. 2008 should have been a wake up call for most of us. Am I right? That there's something fundamentally wrong with the monetary system in which we live in. 2008 really should have been a thing where you saw a government pretty much bail out your banking system. Where they really got the money, we still don't know. Where does the, where does the government get trillions of dollars to bail out banks over the weekend? The people said, no, do not bail out the banks. Is that right? The people said, they wrote their congressman, they said, no, do not bail these banks out. They did it anyway, and they found trillions of dollars to do it over the weekend. We really had to ask ourselves, is where does the government that's broke as ours find trillions of dollars to bail somebody out over the weekend? That's something you should ponder. Let's talk about why do we need a resource-based economy. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to give you a lot of facts. I'm just going to kind of give you a conceptual view, and I think some of you already know this. One, we have a problem in the monetary system that production is primarily based upon profit. They do not do anything unless they can make a profit on it. Even your education, your Medicare, your food, these are essential things to life, right? But it's based upon how much profit can I make. That's a dangerous road to go down. That's a very dangerous road. There are some things you probably could make for profit. But basic needs are not something that should be profitable. Because that means that people are not getting their needs met unless somebody's making some money off of it. That's not good. So that's a serious problem. And we see where that level of profit goes. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Another problem with the monetary system, I'm talking about pretty much capitalist system worldwide, is that it leads to overproduction and perpetual consumption. When 9-11 happened, and you know, people like, oh, just raid, people going crazy. What did Bush say to people about a couple of weeks later? Anybody remember? What do you say to, to respond to all this? Go shopping. Go shopping. Go buy something. Right? And then some like eight years later, Obama hit with the same problem with the economy. You know what he says? Go out and buy some cars. He bailed out, the, he bailed out the, the auto industry. Matter of fact, at one brief moment, the government had nationalized the auto industry. We owned it, <laughs> right? We didn't even know that. We owned, the, we owned the auto, well, we won the auto companies. We owned it, right? And they said, no, nah, you can't have too much like socialism, so why don't we sell it back you know, to, the, to the company, you know, let them run it. But basically what I'm saying is, they're saying, he says, go out and buy cars. That's how we grow our economy, is to go out and buy cars. When he goes to other countries, do you realize this man, Obama, as intelligent as he is, he, so part of what he does to go to other countries is to sell military planes. Why did he do that? To grow our economy. That, that doesn't sound to me, I mean, come on. I, don't th I think most fifth graders would say, that doesn't sound quite right. You're gonna sell cars, I understand why you gotta do it because you have a capital system, of course. But that's what you have to do in this type of monetary system. You have to sell things in order to grow the economy. And so that means that people, that we have to go out and buy a lot of things. If you go out here in the, uh, what is it, the uh, quad. quad, right? What do you see? Shopping. Stop. It's wall to wall. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. People got to do what they got to do. Beautiful things out there. I probably wound up buying something for my wife today. All right, I'm not knocking it, but understand, this wall to wall, like a mall out there. We are in essentially the education section. The education section is like over there by the <laughs> bookstore, I think it is. It's like maybe three or four of us, <laughs> booths, at a whole earth festival. Uh, you know, like every other booth should be about, like the planet is in trouble here. Uh, stop buying things right now. The planet's in trouble. Every other booth needs to be about, this is the problem with the planet, get real. We had a whole, first, a whole uh, Earth Festival. But these are individual produced products. These are no, I'm, I'm, I get you. I get you. I'm just making a point. I'm getting a little bit facetious. <laughs> but I'm saying is, is that we need to have much that more dialogue as we possibly can. And I have to kind of contrast it with being out in the uh, Occupy. We had an Occupy Park in, uh, in, in Sacramento where we didn't have the vendors. And I'm not saying we don't have vendors, but one of the positive things about Occupy back then was we had a lot of dialogue about the issue. You didn't have to disagree, you didn't have to agree with me. I didn't want you to. I wanted you to come in, if you were a libertarian, hey, come and argue with me. 
If you're a capitalist, come and argue with me. I think that we need dialogue, and that's what we need out here is dialogue. So I appreciate you coming in for that particular, in that particular point today. So we have a problem with perpetual consumption that creates this desire. We just, you know, we just buy things. We have entire TV shows celebrated about somebody buying a ten thousand dollar purse, some kind of bag, you know, and, and you and you or somebody have another show. My my, my daughter watches this one about uh, the stars are giving their their kids a party, right? And they can see how much money can you spend for the for the kids' party. So one of them spent like you know a hundred thousand dollars for the sixteen year old kids' party. Now I think they might like that, you know, but. <laughs> $100,000, this is the kind of wealth that we have going around in the country in the midst of poverty and starvation, high tuition rates. This is what we have. This is the inequality we have. And so we're supposed to go out and just keep buying things. And I buy things just like anybody else. I'm supporting here a, a Mac, MacBook Air. I'm right in the fix with it, right? Every time Apple sells one of these, they make $500 profit off of it, $500 per unit. This is what we're doing. This kind of problem encourages competition and individualism. Every time you go on the internet, it's all about buying something. It's all about how can you beat the competition. That is seriously backwards. I gotta figure out how I'm gonna beat you in order to get money out of you. I don't know where that, do you understand how that, where that could lead to? I mean, it's already led to a very decrepit type society that we're living in because we're on this kind of rat race. We get up in the morning trying to figure out how I'm gonna get some money out of somebody else. How am I going to, 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 you know, to beat somebody else with the, at the game? How long can we keep playing this game? So it encourages competition, it encourages individualism. It's the thing about watch out for yourself. Now I understand that's kind of human nature a little bit too, but I'm not sure if it's a good thing. And you can, we can have a dialogue about this. I have no problem with that. Encourages greed and indifference. When people have, I want to take your question right to the end, I'm almost done. When people have, you know, hedge fund people making thousands of dollars a minute, a minute, not an hour, serious kinds of money, right? <laughs> and I'm like, we're okay with that. I mean, like, I'm trying, like, what planet are we on here? So he encourages this greed, just, you know, no problem. Mark Zuckerberg at 25 or something years old can make $25 million, you know, personal income, not a problem. Really? That, that's not a problem? Who needs $25 billion to live on? <laughs> I mean, who needs that? Well, what do you do? I'm not trying to imagine. I really want to talk to somebody like that who has that kind of money and say, what are you doing with that kind of money? I need to know, just, just, to, just, just to, for my sanity. I need to know what do you do with that kind of money? Because I, I can't imagine what you do with that kind of money. All right. So we know about the you know the wealth disparity in this country, piece of wealth disparity. Half the country, half the country made how much in income last year? Anybody know how much the half of the country make on average? I thought it was 13 million. No, I'm talking about in terms of in income for half the citizens in this country. Anybody know? $25,000. This is not me quoting this. This is New York Times. 20, most of the people in this country made $25,000 or less. Some people can't even get a job. But yes, we got people being billionaires. You can't be a millionaire no more. They don't have no show called, what's it like to be a millionaire? That's, that's chump change. You got to be a billionaire now in order to be a player. Right? Multi-billionaire. Multi-billionaire. Exactly. I'm going to skip that question because we're going to be a little bit, but I don't want to run you behind time. So we're saying, look, and I know this sounds all socialist and everything, so what? Let's talk about it. We need, to me, a, a system in which we have a planned economy, right, that's not based upon profit. Why do we need that? Because that's what's going to help us survive. I'm not, it sounds like utopia. I, I, I'm clear on that. It does. It sounds like utopia, but there's no other way I, I can see that we can go but that direction. We need a planned economy. I use a simple analogy. See, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm simple-minded. I, I keep things as simple. If you're on an island, 
right? And you had millions of dollars, but there was really no resources to grow things, to build things. Could you survive on the island? <laughs> no, you couldn't survive. Switch it around, if you didn't have any money, but you're on the island and you had the resources, right? You could possibly survive. So we already know that the money thing is just made up. It's a fetish. Marx, I'm sorry to tell you the word, I know it's scary. Karl Marx gave us that a long time ago. Nothing new. Right? Karl Marx said, look, this class struggle that we're having, you know, the differences between the classes, you have them. Believe me, you do. Even though you're not always out in the streets fighting for your rights, you, there's class struggle when you go to work because you're never getting paid enough. Some of you students here, you're already in debt. That's class struggle already. You're already in it. You're already in class struggle. You're just not fighting it, that's all. You're just saying, all right, I'll go with it. I'll deal with it. I'll try to figure it out. You know what I mean? I'm already in debt before I, before I even graduate. Take me another 10, 20, 30 years to pay off my debt. My wife went to school here and she's still paying off her debt. And she makes pretty good money too. Okay? So my thing is, is that this is what we're, kind of, we're faced with. And so we need an economy that says, look, we plan resources. We have technology now, we have automation, we have science, we know how to do these things. I don't want to have a conversation with anybody that says we can't end poverty, you know, in our lifetime. I don't want to have that, con I would not have that conversation with you. So if you already have that question, I cannot have that conversation with you because <laughs> I know that we can have it. I know that we can do that. I'm sorry if you haven't, if you, have, you can't figure that out, but we can. We have the resources, we have the technology, that we can do that. It's not a problem. We got to plan it. Now. Huh? We can do it now. We can do it now. The UN has already said that. The UN has already said that. It said that we can feed the entire world, but we got to change our consumption, uh, 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 the way we consume, the way we produce. These things are not hard. It's embarrassing what we're doing to kids. We're grown people, and we haven't figured this out by now. This is sad. This is not good. It's embarrassing. I'm ashamed. Your RBE, shared global resources. We're already doing it, but we're doing it based on profit. You know you know the footprint that we leave to get your food on the table, right? That's only because somebody wants to make a billion dollars in profit. That's the only reason. It's not the reason. It's not because the food is better overseas than it is here. We know that. It's not that. It's because they want to, make, they want to find cheap labor. So they track it all across the world just so they can make cheap labor. They have good cheap labor and then more profit. It's disgusting. We can use, I talked about we use science, technology, and automation. I don't know why I use that picture there, but I put it in there. Uh, but we, we can do that. And I'm not a scientist, I'm not tech, I wish I were. If I were going to do it all over again, I would study that. But technology, tech, technicians to me should be the politicians if we have to have politicians. What we got now in our leadership are lawyers that know how to talk. They talk, they talk, endlessly talk. They just have no, they have no, really, they don't really understand what they're talking about. But they're making decisions for the rest of the people, the rest of the world, and they're making poor decisions. Or you have salesmen peddling ideas. Yeah, they're selling ideas. This is what Obama does. He goes to sell military aircraft. This is fact. This is what he, so part of his job when he goes there. What do military aircraft do? They go kill people. They're not luxury liners that go like, you know, help people go across the world and visit other cultures and learn about the people. No, he build a plane and go and just kill people. That's what we do. This is the culture that we're reduced to. This is sad, this is sad. Now, this is my own little kind of glitch. I'm not sure, we don't talk too much about this in the, TZM right now, Zeitgeist uh, Movement. But I think we should. I think we need to have real participatory democracy. How do we have real participatory democracy? You cannot be in a democracy when you spend most of your day working. You cannot decide on things that happen in your life when you spend 40 to 50 hours, 60 hours a week working for the man. You cannot decide that. Basically what you're doing is you're deciding based upon some jingle or some little, uh, what do you call those things, ad, slogans. That's what you're deciding, that's what most people decide. When I say you, I'm not saying you personally. But what, that's what most people decide about who they're gonna for, choose for president, or what kind of local policies we have, based upon some slogan. Real participatory democracy means 
that you would spend more time in the local affairs of your family first, your community, and not on your job. We're at the point where we do not have to work 40 hours a week. I guarantee you that. Right now, if we have unemployment problems, double the workforce, cut it down to 20. Done. What's so hard about that? What's hard about it? Because people want to get paid. They got to have the moolah, so we can't do that. Right? It's good to keep people poor in this country. It's profitable. So what we're doing is trying to build Zeitgeist movement. Right? And it's gonna take it's gonna take time, much dialogue. You know, it's not gonna be easy. But we are inviting you to, to you know, learn more about us. Alright, what we're trying to do. I believe you might come up with something even better than what we're talking about. Who knows? You know, we're not being evil like that. It's just we gotta move forward to give these young people. Do you want them facing the same thing today? In other words, I used to ask people this. What are we doing today that's going to make anything different 20, 30, 40 years from now? What are we doing? I tend to think, right, based on what we're doing right now, we can be having the same conversation 20 years ago, for now. And pretty much, I'm, I'm 54 years old. Uh, I think I had it about 30 years ago. <laughs> pretty much the same conversation. But we didn't really do anything that much different. You know what I mean? We really didn't. Sorry, we missed, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I really apologize because that's what I say to my kids. I told my daughter, look, you know what? We haven't done it. We have not done it. You are left with some serious challenges. You really, that, these, these two boys right here and their generation are left with some serious challenges. When their mom and dad pass on, they're gonna be left with some wreckage. If we don't start and say, look, Go to the booths out here, I'll buy your stuff, and we're going to have a conversation about the whole earth. The entire planet is in problems. Right? That's what we got to have. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Presentations and then question and answer? Okay. So we're going to do two more presentations. We want to have some dialogue, so please hang in there with that. Actually, it's three. Three? Okay. They're each about ten minutes, and then we'll be interacting. Uh, quick question, does anyone want uh, some water or some uh, small? Candy? Anybody want water? Anyone? Okay, uh, we're bringing it up. Here. We're bringing it up. Have a seat. We're bringing it up. Okay, uh, so my name is Grisel and I'm going to talk to you about the manufacturing. This is one of the tools that... Uh, where is the microphone? Okay. Can you hear me or do you need me to get the microphone? <laughs> there. This is, this, uh, is a philosophy that companies are approaching now to improve. Uh, so this was born in Japan and it got uh, derived from the Toyota production system in the 90s, become lean manufacturing and the founders at Edward Deming, Taichi Ono, Chingo Chingo and Iji Toyota. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. <laughs> um, so what is lean manufacturing? It's a passion for better, faster, and cheaper. It's a set of tools to reduce uh, the non-value activities, which is waste, and increase the customer satisfaction or quality of product. So what it's basically trying to do is improve pr productivity by um, reducing the resources used and improving the, the customer requirements. So what is waste? It's uh, defective items non-quality product that gets to the customer, overproduction, production, producing more than uh, we have demand for, so it creates a lot of waste. And then uh, waiting or delays when customer doesn't get their, their product on time. And one of the most important ones, not listening to people ideas, uh, transportation, inventory, motion, and excess of processing. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about this. So defect items, what happens if you don't get a product with quality to your customer? He gets angry, and why he gets angry? Because you didn't listen to what he really needs. A product is not just the features of that product, but it's what necessities are uh, covering for that customer. So, um, and also because uh, there's a poor design of the product, 
and there's no training of the people that is creating this product. Overproduction and inventory is when companies create more than what is needed, when they create it faster than when it's needed, and when they create it earlier than when it's needed. And there's also inventory when um, you when companies bought more material than what is needed. And sometimes because if they buy big lots, they will get a better price. So they're just write it buying more material that they won't need just to get a better price on it. And then uh, there's also mo motion and transportation. It's a, when in a company, the work is not designed well for, for the processes. So there's poor ergonomics. There's not a workflow that, a, that an operator can follow. Um, and there's, a, like you can see, there's a mess. So it's really hard for, a, for an operator to do their jobs. And then the one of, the, like I said, the greatest one is when you're not hitting people ideas. Sometimes in companies, uh, the big, uh, um, when they implement a, an improvement, they're based on what the manager thinks is going to improve the, the, um, the company, but they don't actually hear the people that is actually creating the product. So um, this is one of them. And they don't motivate people. Uh, they are low paid. There's a lot uh, high turnover strategy, and uh, they don't train people. And uh, like, and I have examples like this. I've been working in companies where I, I've been just hired, and they will tell me, "Okay, this is your computer, and this is what you're supposed to do." I don't get a work instruction. I don't know what the vision, the mission or the objectives of the company. They don't give me what uh, the, the other departments I need to work with. And then uh, there's not like an identity for the operator or the worker to that company. They're not motivated to, to uh, get the same objectives that the company has. They don't even know them. So these are some of the tools that can help companies to, to get rid of this type of waste. Uh, one is you need to standardize your work. You need to uh, apply the 5S, and I'm going to explain a little bit what 5S is. You need to have a visual control. People tend to work better or understand uh, operations better when they have pictures of them. And then you have manufacturing cells. Uh, in uh, traditional companies, they used to, to get uh, specialized in just one operation. The new approach is Let's work as a team. Let's all know each other's work. So if somebody needs help, we can help them. And then also analyze the work so we can find out what improvements need, need to be made. And then we have TPM, which is total uh, productive maintenance. And it's uh, that instead of waiting for something to, to fail, we're going to prevent that from happening. And then we have polka joke that is a uh, full approved uh, approach. So this is 5S and it comes from Japan and it's first sort. It's, and we can do this like in our house, like what am I still using, what I cannot use anymore. So you sort and then if you don't use anything, uh, you can either recycle it, you can take it to Goodwill. So somebody else and it said, can take a good use of it. The other one is set in order. You have a place for everything, and you have everything in place. So if you need anything, you already know where to get it, and you don't have to search for it. Shine, that's uh, cleaner your equipment. When you clean like, your car, uh, you put oil on it, and you clean it, so it's better to find if something is wrong or needs to be fixed when you, did, you did, uh, do this activity. The other one is the standardization. When you have a, a procedure, when you have one, two, three, four, and you need to follow this in that same order, it's easier to reproduce that, that procedure that when you do it differently every time. And then we have sustain, that's discipline. Follow these five S's every time. Not because you have already implemented once, you're gonna stop and say, okay, I did it, so I'm done. No, it's an ongoing thing. 
to understand or the operator or the worker needs to understand uh, what activities they need to follow. Uh, they need to classify their activities, what is a non-value activity and what is actually giving value to the product. Eliminate any activities that, that uh, they don't add any pro uh, value to the product. And then you can change the se sequence. Uh, simplify it or combine it. And we can do this exercise even in home in the mornings when you get ready to go to school. Like uh, if you analyze what you do first, you wake up, you go to the uh, restroom, and then uh, you, you can uh, get a shower, and then everything activity that comes in the, in the restroom or the bathroom, you do it first, and then you move to the kitchen. And everything activity that you do in the kitchen, you do it there because it will take you more time if you do uh, if you um, do one in the bathroom and then one in the in the kitchen and you go back and forth so you're losing uh, time okay yeah, this is a tool that they use is full of proof and it's for example your USB they can only go one way so it's kind of like um, fixing the system so the operator won't have a way to, to do it wrong. And that this, it, it will reduce inspection too, because you know that there's no way you're gonna get that product wrong. And then we have Kanban. Kanban is, uh, is get the quantity you need, when you need it, and it's like when you go to the supermarket, if you run out of uh, shampoo, uh, you just get one bottle you know that you're gonna run out of shampoo and then you go get it. And it's not like you buy these huge mass uh, boxes of shampoo and probably you won't, or probably it will be food that will, it will turn bad. So just use, buy what you need. And then total uh, productive maintenance. Like I said, it's clean, inspect. Don't wait, it's like when your car you don't wait until it's, it's broken, so you can take it uh, to maintenance. You have a scheduled time, like every three months or every t uh, 3,000 miles, you go and take maintenance to it, and that you will prevent in your car to get uh, broken. And then we have Kaizen, that is continuous improvement. Everything can be improved. Uh, so use your creativity, your innovation, work with teams because somebody will, t will have another idea that you haven't think of. So work in teams and uh, it, this is a people-oriented uh, approach. So if you do this Kaizen activity, um, the company will develop growth because you're listening to everybody's ideas and you always try to improve your, your processes. And then this is the comparison between traditional manufacturing and lead manufacturing. Uh, quality, uh, you detect the defect after it happened, but with lead manufacturing, you detect it before it happened, so you are preventing it for company. And then production, instead of produce, traditional companies, they have a, a goal, I'm gonna produce 500 items of this. No, just produce what the, the demand is for, not more than that. Maintenance is like, like I said, being reactive. Don't wait until it's broken to fix it. And then uh, employees, instead of uh, having a people that only can do one job, having in teams and everybody help each other and everybody knows the other people uh, work so they can help each other. And then simplicity. Uh, Try to simplify your processes, make it as simple as possible, use the pocket jokes, so it will be better uh, for the operator to, to um, follow the process. So this is, uh, these are some quotes that are based on lean manufacturing. And the first one is, a corporation is a living organism it has to continue to shed its skin. Methods have to change, focus has to change, values have to change. The sum of all these changes is transformation. And then one from Albert Einstein is, the world we have created is a product of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. 
And the last one is from Albert Agut. Waste is a tax on the whole people. All this waste that companies are generating, we're paying for it. So uh, in order to implement this philosophy or these tools in companies, we have to, or the operators, the managers, everyone in these companies, they need to change their set of mind and be willing to change. This started in 1990. I've been working in companies that they have, haven't been successful in implementing either of these tools. And the main reason is because people are not willing to change. Their, they uh, want to stay in their comfort zone. So it's just a matter of us uh, accepting that we need a change and improving our improving the company procedures. So that's it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Almost done. I'm just going to be talking about transition. How can we get from here to a resource-based economy? And uh, and then we'll have one more presentation. I don't need sound. Yeah. So I'm just going to just. I use the same template as she did. All right. Um, I don't know if I really need this, but so um, what we just heard, I think, is an example of the kind of optimized technology that we could see more of in a resource-based economy um, and approach. And but how do we get there? So I think that's a pretty challenging question. How do we get there? And uh, there are many more ideas that I can cover today. I recommend that you visit the Zeitgeist Movement blog site and search transition. There's a handout that's going around that has all these URLs on it, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, the other thing I want to say before I get started is we can't predict exactly how we'll transition. There are just too many unpredictable moving parts. We have potential environmental collapse, employment collapse, dollar and debt collapse, peak oil, and we just can't possibly predict how all these things are going to interact. That said, there are two main transition strategies that people do have in mind, and I want to go over those today. And again, I recommend you go to the blog site to learn about more ideas. But these are, these are the two most popular ones, I think. Awareness building, to build a critical mass of people ready to try a resource-based economy. And two, supporting RBE-like projects in our existing economy. And two overlaps a bit with one, and I'll get into how that, how that is later. So awareness building, three types. I see small-scale group, large-scale, and small-scale individual. Small scale group, some examples from the Zeitgeist movement. We have annual events, Z Day, the Zeitgeist Media Festival is arts based. Other events, we meet at the Davis Farmers Market on Saturdays, events like this one. The Venus Project is actually the organization that started the concept, that founded the concept, created originally the concept of a resource based economy. And they have a website, you can Google that. They also have extensive group work that you can get involved in. A large scale. I think, I dare say maybe all of us are here because uh, we saw these movies. Uh, these are the two movies, Moving Forward and Addendum. Starting, you know, watch Addendum first and Moving Forward. They're both on YouTube, millions of views, I think, at this point. You can also go to zeitgeistmovie.com. Venus Project's major motion picture that they are trying to raise money to, I think they've finally raised enough money to hire the scriptwriter. They want a kind of a day in a life or like a, a visceral sense of what it would be like in a resource-based economy. I don't know much more about the details. And they would love to create a demonstration city, very expensive in our monetary system. So that, that may or may not happen. But there are lots of opportunities to get involved in either of those. And then the Global Redesign Institute is an organization that Peter Joseph started, and it's 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 uh, up and coming. And the goal there, as I understand it, is to uh, basically bring people who have the capacity to get a get a, as good a survey as possible of what the Earth has in terms of resources and technology as of today's date. Basically, the current techno technological uh, possibilities and design virtually what the world could look like specifically in a resource-based economy. So there are lots of opportunities to get involved in these last two bullets. Awareness building small-scale individual. 
The three main types I've seen are social networking, blogging, video creation. I'm sure there are others, but those are the main uh, areas where I've seen people focus as individuals spreading the word. Um, I want to kind of put a footnote on this. There's a, there's a toolkit called Collaborative Communication that I recommend. Uh, it's also called Nonviolent Communication, more commonly, or NBC. And I, I recommend this for any kind of awareness spreading uh, because, um, if in my experience, it can turn win-lose arguments into collaborative, partnership-based, problem-solving opportunities. And uh, the reason for that is explained really well in the book No Contest by Alfie Cohn. There are hundreds of, hundreds of studies showing that collaboration yields more reliable, innovative, and stress-free results than competition. And actually, those findings are uh, also speak to why we believe a resource-based economy can work. A resource-based economy is based on collaboration and not competition. Our basic biological and quality of life needs are met by default. And so we do not need to compete to get those needs met. We can collaborate. A little bit more information, you can go to cnbc.org, check out this book, Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life, attend one of the many NBC workshops offered everywhere, including uh, uh, by Alex Leach, kindcommunication.org, and Davis. I also teach, but more irregularly. You can support our, okay, so that, that was awareness building. This is the second category of how we might move to this to this resource-based economy vision. Support RBE-like projects in our existing economy. What I mean by that are projects that are collaborative, are environmentally friendly and sustainable, generate freely shared intellectual property and possibly free or very low cost goods and services, getting us off the monetary system in one or more areas of our lives. Utilize technology and show us how it can help and provide abundance where there once was scarcity. In other words, support open source or crowdsource projects. And our next presenter is gonna, I think, be touching on, yeah, that. Open source projects, for those who are not familiar, are projects that people engage in as volunteers, usually in their spare time. They collaborate, usually online, to create such things as free software, source code, general educational information like Wikipedia, and increasingly hardware design. And here's the interesting thing. Why do they do that? Why do people do that? I recommend the YouTube video Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. It's a fun little animated uh, summary of Dan Pink's book, Drive, uh, summarizing his findings about showing that we innovate best when our biological and quality of life needs are separately and securely met and we're motivated purely by connection, contribution, purpose, and or mastery. And again, those findings I think also support, uh, well, they explain why so many of us believe that a resource-based economy could result in an exponential increase in innovation and technology. Our biological and quality of life needs would be met and we could be motivated purely by connection, contribution, purpose, and our mastery. More about open source projects. Examples of open source hardware include uh, projects that are hardware focused, um, window farms, the RepRap three-dimensional printer, and various open source ecology product, uh, projects, including the Global Village construction set at the end of this, which will be done very soon. There are a couple of quick little YouTube videos on two of these examples. Uh, more about open source projects. Traditionally cited benefits of open source projects include making more things accessible to more people and greater reliability, stability, transparency, flexibility, support, and accountability. And this probably, such benefits probably explain why the open source software Linux, for example, now powers the vast majority of internet traffic. And they drive without the Cohn's findings described in his book, No Contest, about the greater benefits that come from collaboration compared to competition as well. And I see three RB specific benefits of supporting open source project, uh, projects. One, help people survive the predicted collapse of our current system. Give them ways to survive with free information, goods and services that can help them live, for example, growing their own food in a small a space. Two, hasten the collapse of our current system and hopefully the transition to a resource-based economy by reducing our use of money and hence reducing growth in GDP. And finally, to build awareness. I said, as I said, this category overlaps with the first one about building awareness. 
that is built increased familiarity with, credibility of, and trust in RBE-like projects, hopefully leading to a critical mass of people to say, why not go all the way? And what do I mean by that? Why not go all the way to a worldwide sustainable, to a worldwide sustainable open source everything economy, aka a resource-based economy? Just final couple notes before the videos. Most don't see legislative change playing much of a role in the transition. However, people in favor of a resource-based economy do work to ensure the path remains clear for transition as much as possible. For example, working to keep the internet freely accessible so we can do our blogging and our videos and so on, social networking. And there is a recognition that certain legislative changes certainly couldn't hurt, including monetary system, uh, monetary reform, such as ending the Federal Reserve System, but we do try to focus the primary uh, bulk of our energy, because we only have so much spare time in the system, on the kinds of strategies that I've already uh, talked about. So with that, I want to just give this, this is a three minute video about window farms. Oh, yeah. hold on one minute, technical issue. Hopefully that'll work. Actually, this is the, these are the headphones. Really quick, I have two videos, and to me they represent the um, ends of the spectrum of how you can get involved in open source projects. On one end, very simple, this is very simple, anybody could do it in their spare time. <coughs> the other example is all the way at the other extreme, people devoting a tremendous amount of, of time, spare time probably to some extent, but you'll see what I mean. Okay, let's see if I can make this go. There's no sound. Oh, you know what, it's on, it's on you. That's okay. And now we're to the next video. Paul. Here we go. There's some growing excitement around urban vertical farming right now. By growing food inside, in urban centers, we can reduce carbon dioxide emissions from shipping all of that food, and limit the amount of land that's really ravaged by industrial agriculture, and also ensure that our food is more healthy and it's free of pesticides and all sorts of other nasty stuff. Filling our cities with farms makes so much sense on so many levels socially, economically, environmentally, we started to wonder if this means that we're going to have to wait